This is John Haidt, uh, very, well, you can read it in your brochures, obviously, it's from the University of Virginia. Um, I didn't realize this, you got a Templeton Prize for Positive Psychology. Yes, I did, oh. proudly, yes. Nice. Um, bless you. And, <laughs> and also has a wonderful book, which I highly recommend, called The Happiness Hypothesis, one of the spate of happy, happy talk books that came out. Well, this one, this is, one, this, is, this is very interesting one. I do recommend it. John Hyde, anyway. <laughs> thank you, Roger. And thank you so much for not putting me on uh, before lunch when we were running overtime and I would have to stand between the entire audience and lunch. I hope people are <clears throat> uh, more uh, uh, relaxed, well-fed, and uh, uh, ready to like what I say. <clears throat> um, in talking about some areas, in which there's, there are disagreements in the room, I think it's very useful for us to make really clear uh, what it is that we agree on. I think there's a lot of shared agreement. Um, <clears throat> so in thinking about religion and morality, uh, here are a few, uh, a few statements that I think most of, uh, almost all of us would agree with. First, that uh, I think Dawkins is right, that uh, there's, you know, the, the Noma idea should be discarded, and that if there are gods and creator gods, the world would be different and probably measurably different. Um, uh, secondly, as also as Dawkins says, we can't be certain. Uh, you know, we, we can't all rate ourselves as seven out of seven on the certainty scale. Um, but uh, our world does not appear to be a world with gods. And if that is true, then the historical, cosmological, and causal claims of religions are mostly, uh, or perhaps even entirely in some cases, false. Um, so I do agree with, with, with Dan and with, with Sam Harris and with the, the uh, uh, other recent writers um, that the factual claims of religion are by and large false and, and I would never say that we should hide that or shush it or, or do something because we don't want to upset them. So I, I'm on board with all of those claims. <clears throat> and I think all of us here agree that religion is a natural phenomena and it should be studied by the methods of natural sciences. Please raise your hand if you agree, basically agree with all of these statements. Okay, so we have consensus in the room on those things. Let's move on now. Okay, I think I'll just, I'll just sit down right now. Excuse me. Well, I'm assuming there are some disagreements with one statement here and there. Raise your hand if you disagree with most of them. Oh, okay. All right, well, we'll talk afterwards. Okay. Um, for, morality, I think, uh, for morality, I think we can do the same sort of thing. Uh, morality is a natural phenomenon. Much of morality is innate, and by innate, uh, I simply mean I, I found... Um, Gary Marcus has this wonderful book, The Birth of the Mind. I, th I know it's a complicated subject for philosophers and but his definition is it just means structured in advance of experience. Evolution provides the first draft of, of the mind and then experience edits it. Uh, so on that view, much of the structure uh, is created by kin selection and reciprocal altruism. Those are two of the processes that do a lot of the work, although I'm with David Wilson on this, that there's a lot more. Uh, so raise your hand if you agree with these three statements. Okay, so again, most people... Excuse me? Much <laughs> with methods. Okay. See, this is, this is the problem with having philosophy. Are you a philosopher by any chance? No, no, but he was trained in English school, so he knows okay. about grammar. <laughs> okay. But it is ambiguous. No, yeah, okay, you're right. Bad idea in this group. All right, at any rate. So here's where I think we agree. Uh, here, but, so, so here are three areas where I think there is, this is, I think, the, the, the cutting edge, the state of the art in uh, the study of morality is on these three questions. Uh, how trustworthy is moral reasoning? What is the domain of morality? And is religion an evolutionary adaptation, which has implications for morality? Uh, a view that I'll characterize as Enlightenment 1.0, although I know that there have been many views on this, on each of these questions, um, is that... Uh, moral uh, reasoning is not only very trustworthy when done well, um, but it is our only hope, and we must find ways. To the extent that many people don't reason well, we must find ways to help people reason well. We must enlarge the constituency of reason, as some, somebody or other said. Um, and uh, once you begin to use your reason, to look the process of reasoning, to look at the moral domain, and you generally want to start from first principles and move out, uh, the tendency is to start with the first principle that what matters is the individual, and then you very quickly come to the view that morality, as, as Sam Harris said, uh, is about uh, happiness and suffering. Or as, as, as Mill said, it basically is about harm. There's no reason we should tell anyone to do anything unless we are preventing others from being harmed. Um, and when you uh, use reasoning to look at, uh, at religion, uh, you quickly see that it runs afoul of the definition of morality that you just came to, 
You also see that it leads people to do things that seem to be a waste of time and effort if it's based on, on factually untrue uh, premises. Therefore, uh, it seems that the religion is a big mistake. Now, of course, ideas that religion is an adaptation and at the, for the group level uh, have, a, have a history. But for the most part, the state of the arts now seems to be most of the people studying this seem to think that religion is a byproduct. It's a mistake. Um, um, uh, so that I, that's what I'm going to characterize as, uh, I think these are either the dominant or certainly very popular positions right now. I'd like to suggest that all three of these positions need to be revised, although none need to be completely rejected. Uh, my own view and my own research is that uh, we are not very good at reasoning. Well, that's not news. I mean, there's a lot of research showing how bad people ordinarily are at reasoning. I think at moral reasoning, we're far, far worse. Um, when we don't care about something, we can engage in reasoning, and sometimes even moderately well. But once we care about things, uh, as I'll show you, I believe that we tend to reason uh, in order to find evidence, not truth, um, to find supporting evidence for our position, not, not truth. Um, secondly, um, I think the, the, just the descriptive facts about what do people see as the moral domain show that the moral domain is in fact quite variable and usually quite broad. Uh, only in a few pockets of this planet do you find moral, syst uh, moral systems uh, that really are limited to issues of harm and by extension fairness, rights, justice, those sorts of individual based. Um, usually I believe moral systems, especially for conservative and religious groups, are about what I would call moral communal capital, which I'll explain in a moment. And third, uh, once you take this view about moral communal capital, then the idea of religion as an adaptation for creating community begins to make a lot more sense. So those are the three positions that I'll argue for, but these are exactly the sorts of things that I, I hope that I think this group is ideal uh, as a, uh, to be, I'm sorry, I got the grammar all screwed up there. I hope we can talk about these three questions. All right. Um, so on the first question, how trustworthy is moral reasoning? Um, there ha are, have certainly been emotivists over the last few hundred years in, in, in moral philosophy, but the dominant position for much of the last part of the 20th century was the position of Lawrence Kohlberg, um, which is focusing on reasoning. Uh, and so the uh, Kohlbergian view is that the child starts off with no morality in contrast, um, uh, well, certainly to either ev to evolutionary, uh, well, the child starts off with nothing. You don't need to assume anything is innately there in terms of content. And then by the sort of Piagetian processes, the sort of processes that Jean Piaget said children use to understand the physical world, children come to understand the social world by taking different perspectives, by basically reasoning about it. They're able to figure things out for themselves. Um, and um, uh, if they have enough good quality, high quality experiences, they reach the highest level at which by process of reasoning, they can question even the, even the foundations or the, the widespread assumptions of their own culture. So the point is the action is to be found in reasoning. That's what moral psychology was with the study of moral reasoning for a long time. Um, uh, I think, though, that the, the, um, the field is moving very strongly in the direction of intuition. It's moving away from Kohlberg's rationalism to embrace a position that was articulated uh, uh, by David Hume, the famous phrase that reason is... Uh, I'll leave out the ought only to be. Let's just say reason is the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. So a Humean model would be that you first have what he called passion or sentiment. But I think the best word really is intuition. We get into a lot of trouble when we say emotion versus reasoning, or even the, or the worst is cognition versus emotion. My view is it's all cognition. The mind is doing all kinds of processing to reach conclusions, but there's two kinds of cognition. There's intuitive or quick automatic pattern matching type cognitions, and then there's reasoning, which is slower, more sim sim symbol based. Um, so if we make this intuition, uh, this is the view that I'm arguing for. Uh, intuitions come first, and they usually have an affective component. They usually feel like something, good or bad. Intuition comes first, leads to judgment. Uh, we feel that something is wrong, and then we make up, well, we, we engage in reasoning afterwards to make sense of that, and, and Ted referred to that process earlier today. This is certainly the view that, uh, that uh, E.O. Wilson took in, in sociobiology when he uh, declared that moral philosophers are largely just justifying their intuitions, and he suggested that only by interpreting the activity of the emotive centers as a biological adaptation can the meanings of the canons be deciphered. So this is the view that I'm arguing for. I do think that E.O. Wilson was prophetic in many ways about where the field of moral psychology has gone. He laid out a lot of it uh, in just really in this quote, and I think that it took a long time to get there, but I think we're now, based, oh, we're now just about there. Uh, I won't go through the, the evidence. I've written some review papers reviewing research in social psychology, and I think it's fair to say that the general consensus in social psychology nowadays is that uh, we, our reasoning is easily influenced 
by our motives. And there are two broad classes of motives. The two most common kinds are relatedness motives and coherence motives. Um, we uh, pass judgments and we think about things and we reason about things uh, largely in the context of really trying to keep our relationships intact. We don't want uh, to create problems and frictions with our friends. So those relatedness motives bias our reasoning quite heavily. And coherence motives. When we have a worldview, we have things worked out, somebody says something, somebody comes up with a scientific theory that seems to upset it, and we don't say, oh, isn't that interesting? Let me think about that. We say, no way, and let me think about why it's wrong, and here's why it's wrong. So um, that's the first problem. Reasoning is generally motivated when there are feelings of any kind involved. Second, post hocery, uh, we are superb uh, post hoc reasoners. We can't stop ourselves. Going back to the Gazaniga split brain studies, just if you cut the brain in half, one, brain's gonna, one side's going to just make up stuff about actions caused by the other side. Um, we have what you might call an inner lawyer constantly working constantly working to prepare a legal brief, just in case we get charged with something. In case somebody accuses me of something, I'm going to have reasons at the ready to give them. And those of you who are married, I challenge you. Next time, I swear, I, I was, I've been doing this work for 20 years, and when I was writing an article on this stuff, my wife said to me, John, I told you, please don't leave the dirty dishes on the counter. And while she was saying it, my mouth was moving. And I was saying, well, the baby was crying, and the dog had to go out, and, and I, I just put the dishes. And I realized only afterwards that I had totally lied to her because it's true that the baby had cried at some point and the dog had barked at some point and I had breakfast at some point. Those were three totally different points, but I put them together to defend myself. Um, all right, so we, we can't stop it. This happens all the time. And third, intuitive primacy, um, research on psychopaths, research on all kinds of decision making suggests that when you want to predict behavior, intuitions and emotions generally predict what people do, whereas uh, reasoning sometimes does, but generally not nearly as well. So I, th these are some of the reasons why I came to the view that really intuition is at the basis of our uh, moral judgment and reasoning plays a relatively post hoc role. Um, I, won't, I don't have time to show you the <clears throat> videos of these studies, but I've, I've put people in all kinds of situations. Um, I give them uh, uh, moral judgment vignettes that feel wrong. You know instantly that something is wrong. Consensual adult sibling incest with two forms of birth control, or a, a woman who uh, eats an unclaimed corpse because she's a vegetarian for moral reasons, but she's curious what meat tastes like, and they're throwing out the body anyway. She works in a pathology lab. Um, <laughs> And everybody says, well, this is horrible, this is terrible, but you know, it is, we constructed it to be harmless. Um, and we wanted to know, when people respond to these stories, are they more, do they behave more like uh, uh, in this dilemma from, from Lawrence Kohlberg about should a man steal a drug to save uh, his wife who's dying of cancer? And we wanted to compare these stories. Are they going to be more like this reasoning story, or are they going to be more like these situations here that you know are just gut feelings? Um, uh, where we, we dunked a cockroach in a, in a glass of apple juice and asked people if they drink it, and they say, no, we'll get a disease. You know, no, you won't because it's totally sterilized. I just don't want to drink it. It's disgusting. Um, and my favorite one, my favorite experimental task that I've ever done, it'll go over especially well here, this was suggested by Bart Simpson in an episode where Bart sells his soul. So we gave people this piece of paper, and we asked them if they would sign it, we'll give them $2 for real on the spot, and then they can rip it up right away. It's not a legal or binding contract and most people don't want to sign. And then we try to get them to explain. <laughs> Why not? Um, <clears throat> all right. So the point is, if you put people in these sorts of situations, again, I, I, I don't have time to show you, the, show you the videos, but you get people saying, this, the, the ones I'll show you, these are from the consensual adult sibling incest story. Uh, the experimenter, Scott Murphy, would, he explained in, in advance that he's going to argue with them, he's going to play devil's advocate. Um, but you can, you can push people to the point where they are morally dumbfounded, where they say things like, I agree with that counter-argument, I respect that opinion, I'm afraid I'm not swaying on this topic, I just feel too strongly against it, or, gosh, this is hard, I don't really, I mean, there's no way I could change my mind, but I just don't know how to show what I'm feeling. Or I don't have like a point that says, okay, that's why it's wrong, but it's like a gut thing where I think it's wrong. I mean, you could try to possibly change my mind, but I probably wouldn't. Um, so my point is that all of you recognize these situations where you know that something is right or wrong, and if somebody just strips away your reasons, you're not going to say, oh, I guess you're right. What you say is, I know it's wrong, I just can't explain it. So um, uh, there's a lot more I could say here, but I just want to uh, make the point that the state of the art in moral psychology, I believe, has been a move away from Kohlberg's rationalism towards the view that intuition underlies. Again, this is just descriptively. You can say what you want normally, but just descriptively, I think we have a very different view. So this is part of morality 2.0. All right, on the second point, what's the domain of morality? This is the most widely used definition of morality in moral psychology from Elliot Turiel, who was a student of Kohlberg's. Um, he tried to give it a, a and he drew, he drew it very explicitly on the Enlightenment tradition uh, in coming up with this definition. He said, it's prescriptive judgments of justice, rights, and welfare pertaining to how people ought to relate to each other. That's what morality is about. 
And if you look at those three terms, uh, I think they correspond to two psychological systems. Uh, we have, there's something in us that makes us very sensitive to care and harm and nurturing, especially of children or vulnerable creatures. And Carol Gilligan talked about the ethic of care in contrast to La Lawrence Kohlberg's emphasis on fairness and justice. And these two, I think, come out pretty easily from kin selection and reciprocal altruism. And from what I can tell, almost every, most of what's written on the evolution of morality focuses on those two processes. I'm with David in saying that, yes, that those are very important, um, but that at a certain point, other processes kicked in. Uh, when we think of exemplars, we might think of Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King uh, of, as people who, um, uh, who exemplified one or the other based on, based on their actions. Uh, so <clears throat> my definition, um, um, my definition, though, is very different because what I found is that when you def limit the moral domain to issues of, of, of harm and issues of fairness, um, most of what other people seem to care about, other cultures in the world seem to care about, gets treated as a social convention by Turiel or just as, as mindless superstition um, by more scientifically minded folk. Uh, and I don't, think that's, I don't think that's right, at least descriptively, if it's a huge part of their morality, we need to at least try to understand it. So what I found works is to think about uh, moral systems as um, uh, interlocking sets of values, practices, institutions, and evolved psychological mechanisms that work together to regulate or suppress selfishness. That's what it's really all about. Um, there is trying to suppress people's tendency to free ride, exploit, harm for their own benefit so that we can all live much more productively uh, together. There are two very, very different approaches that cultures take. Uh, we Western educated uh, uh, liberal types live in a world in which uh, the fundamental unit is the individual. That is the source of all value. Groups only matter to the extent that they uh, are composed of individuals. So we think of society as, you know, be it billiard balls or whatever, but um, we think of society as individuals moving about. And if individuals move about, then the really important thing, we need to suppress selfishness here. How are we going to do it? We're going to teach those individuals not to harm anyone and not to, not to cheat. We have to be fair and we have to be uh, benevolent. So as long as you can uh, uh, arrange your society and your institutions and your educational system to promote harm and fairness, you can have a wonderful society. And this is, I believe, what we are really aiming for. At least when I say we, I mean people like, people like us here in this room. But um, <clears throat> throughout human history, or throughout, uh, uh, whether you want to say the last 10,000 or, or hundreds of thousands of years, um, human beings have lived in what you might call at, uh, lattice land. Um, it's not the individual that's primary. Most uh, people in traditional societies don't think of the individual as primary. They think of the family or the group as primary. And when you do that, you now need things. Uh, it is effective. It is important to have things like concerns about in-group and loyalty, concerns about authority and respect and deference. Um, and concerns about purity and sanctity, which are a bit more complicated. But the point is that these are not about helping each individual express itself. These are about keeping the group together as a functioning, coherent, trustable, tr uh, trustworthy, trusting, um, cooperative entity. So just to animate this a little bit, um, uh, so if this is one joint family in India, this is another joint family in India, uh, and uh, one daughter marries into uh, the, the, uh, the other family, another uh, girl, young woman moves into this family. Um, but now, because of the marriage, these two families are linked. And if it was a well-arranged marriage, this family has just moved up in status by its connection with this family. So there is still movement. Uh, um, and people are very interested in what other groups are doing and, and also what other individuals are doing. Um, but in, in this kind of world, you don't just see individuals, you see groups. Now, um, I have a lot of data on these, these, what I'm calling these five foundations. I'm suggesting that harm and fairness are two found psychological systems that are universally present. These other three, I believe, are universally present, but are not as developed uh, in, in, in modern Western uh, societies. Not that they need to be developed, I'm just saying that they are all part of the human potential, and cultures vary in whether they do or do not develop it. So I've developed a number of scales to measure how much people endorse statements and values uh, and trade-offs related to the five foundations. And what this graph shows is when you look at the subscales of these questionnaires, um, this is a, a large internet study we did. There's uh, sep about 700 people who are US citizens in this. Uh, the, green and the green bar represents people's scores on the fairness questions. The blue bar represents their scores on the harm questions. The left edge is very, people who declared themselves to be very liberal, liberal, slightly liberal, all the way up to very conservative. What we see is that on the harm and fairness questions, the liberals are very high. And as people get more conservative, they get a little less concerned about harm and fairness. Um, these other three, in-group authority and purity, are very low for, for liberals, but as people get more conservative, they get more important to the point where, for very conservative people, all five are equally important. 
in this very large study, we had uh, also we had enough uh, people from the UK that we could see the same pattern. British people in our sample were a bit more liberal, so the curves look a little bit different. We see the same converging pattern. Uh, we then uh, improved the scale in a variety of ways and uh, put it up uh, online where anyone could take it. And we recently got 13,000 people taking it. Um, uh, and now you can see with a larger sample, uh, we, you now see the effects are extremely linear. Very liberal people basically say it's harm and, fair, harm and fairness, and these other three don't matter. And we have very linear effects, very good correlations with uh, politics, so that harm and fairness become less important, but the other three become more important. Once you look at it this way, that very liberal people have a two, a two foundation morality and very conservative people or uh, conservatives have a five foundation morality, I believe that the culture war makes a lot more sense and the strategy that Karl Rove used to, um, uh, for, to engineer the Republican victories is I think much easier to see. If, um, if liberals stand for a two foundation morality, for harm and fairness and for rejecting all that other stuff, um, um, then it's very easy to see how this can become a nightmare, or at least could be portrayed as a nightmare. So I just Googled family, and I picked what looked like a, a very uh, ordinary white middle class uh, family um, 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 uh, trying to raise its, its two girls. And what do they find all around them, these parents? They find images of sex all over. This is Madonna um, saying, express yourself. And she's expressing herself with somebody or other there. Um, and sex is good. And if you want to express yourself, uh, by slitting your tongue, that's your choice. It's your tongue, you're not hurting anyone. You can express yourself. If you want to take drugs, it's your choice, it's your brain, it's nobody's business. If you want to burn the flag, hey, dissent is patriotic. It's a good thing to express yourself. If you want to have an abortion, that, that's entirely your choice. It's your body. Don't let anyone else tell you what to do with your body. This is not a person, this is just a bit of flesh. Um, if you want to end your life, call uh, Jack Kevorkian. And if you want to spice up your sex life, you can buy the baby Jesus butt plug because for liberals, sacrilege is funny because subversion is good. The best thing that people can say about your book or your painting or your, or, or your novel is that it's subversive, right? You're thrilled if your work is called subversive. If you're a liberal, subversion is good because whatever exists as an institution is oppressive, is old, is bad. You want to subvert it. Um, given this, I think it was quite easy for Rove to scare Americans, and it, he didn't have to do very much. It wasn't even that much trickery. Um, uh, when you put it all together like this, it looks quite awful. But on each of those issues, you probably agree with the position uh, uh, that the Democrats or that, li that liberals hold. Um, so to conclude this point, um, a newer view of morality, morality 2.0, which I think is essential for getting the Enlightenment right, is that the moral domain is broader than we think. We can't just go with our own morality. Descriptive, I think the descriptive facts are coming in. Um, uh, politically, I think this explains why there's so much resistance to our program, um, to the kind of world that we want to engineer. Uh, most Americans, at least, don't want to live in that kind of world. The story may be different in Europe. But I think we could talk about diversity later. I do think that diversity is actually one of the reasons why we are so conservative here. Um, uh, normatively speaking, of course, they could be wrong. I mean, the philosophers in the room, I'm sure, are thinking, so what if most people believe that in-group and authority and purity are part of morality? They're, they could just be wrong. Well, of course, they could be wrong. Um, but um, before we conclude that they are wrong and we are right, it is crucial, it is vital that we recognize exactly what morality does to us. Uh, and Dan's comments about how we are committed to reason, um, we are committed to a self-corrective process, and that wonderful quote um, that Roger gave us uh, from Ibn al whatever it was about how we should even question our own thinking is exactly right here and this is the nature of science we have to realize morality is not just about protecting others from harm morality is about binding our team together so we can fight other teams morality is about our team and uh, what holds us together therefore morality makes us blind to any good arguments on the other side that's just part of the nature of morality I believe we liberals uh, and scientists are in conflict with them. Um, please raise your hand in this, in this room. Are you left of center or right of center politically? Please raise your hand if you would say you are left of center or liberal. Raise your hand. And please raise your hand if you'd say you are right of center or conservative. You, you mean on, uh, personal or on social issues, on social issues, on social issues. Raise your hand, yeah. Raise your hand if you would say you are right of center or conservative on social issues. Okay, one person. So this is a relatively conservative crowd for, for, for academe. <laughs> Because usually it's not, it's, I mean, that's, not, that's like 5%, or no, that's like 3%, and that's pretty high compared to what I normally see. So um, my point is that there is an us and them. We do not encounter moral diversity. Our team is almost perfectly purified. And given that, we have to expect our reasoning to be biased. It can't be otherwise. 
unless we take really difficult steps to counter it, our team has gotten together on this, we've purged everyone else. I don't know about your fields, but in psychology, we create a hostile climate for conservatives. At our conferences, we make jokes about how dumb they are. That's gonna really discourage uh, conservatives from coming into our field. So we have perfect uh, lack of diversity, and this is gonna blind us, it's gonna make it very hard. Um, so as scientists, if we are committed to scientific ideals, we have an obligation to not just charge forward on our prejudices, but to actively challenge our moral prejudices. Um, my last point, and this will be the briefest, um, is religion and evolutionary adaptation. Um, um, I'm not gonna go through the, the arguments. David did a wonderful job presenting what the position is about uh, uh, how, uh, how uh, religion is an adaptation at the group level um, with major transitions. Um, and so religion is obviously well suited to binding people together, to bring them together. Um, I don't think it's uniquely qualified. I think we can find alternatives to religion, but they may not be quite as powerful. Uh, but that they may be the way to go. What I want to contribute to the discussion is this is the, the concept of moral communal capital. Um, so as David said, major transitions are never completed. You have people coming together, you have cooperation, um, but it's always vulnerable to coming apart, always. So um, there's always the threat of enemy whenever you have a good society. There's always the threat that it will grow apart, that people will uh, uh, no longer share common norms and you'll lose the cooperation that got you to where you are. Um, I, just by coincidence, I'm using, I guess, not the same Bosch painting, but I think Bosch does a great job of presenting the image of order moving to disorder, a very common trope, a very common human belief that there once was a golden age and now everything has gone to hell. Um, many of you know the concept of social capital. Uh, uh, Robert, Roger, um, sorry, um, Putnam, uh, defines it, them as, defines it as social networks and the associated norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness. So social capital is in part an antidote to anomie. You want to live in a, in a group with high social capital. With high social capital, you can leave your, your bag and your computer around when you go to lunch. You can trust people. You don't have to lock your doors. Um, when challenges arise, you know you can count on your neighbors. But social capital is not enough. Social capital doesn't just exist in space. Social capital needs an institutional surround. And this is the concept that I'd like to contribute to this discussion of group selection. Um, so I, I define it as moral communal capital, as social capital plus the institutions, traditions, and norms that guarantee that contributions and hard work will uh, be rewarded and that free riders, exploiters, and criminals will be punished. So if we put, if we imagine, uh, uh, be it you know, a building or a society, all kinds of institutions, traditions, uh, and I'll even just put a little decoration on it just to suggest the kind of, of, of building or institution that at least is effective. Whatever else you think about it, um, uh, religions are very effective at increasing moral communal capital. And if you think about the factors that increase moral communal capital, I hope you'll find this a very disturbing list. Um, if you believe that the group is the fundamental source of value, if you emphasize similarity, if you are strict in raising your children, authoritative parenting works too, but authoritarian is all about getting kids to uh, uh, contribute to moral communal capital and not to undermine it. Uh, religion, uh, emphasis on duties, and supporting authority, all of these things increase moral communal capital and groups, and as David said, um, uh, well, uh, selfishness may win within groups, but altruistic groups or cohesive groups, uh, or the gold team, is more likely to vanquish the silver team. So moral communal capital is increased by these factors that seem obviously very conservative, um, factors that undermine it. Um, if you think that the individual is the fundamental source of value, if you celebrate diversity and tolerance, you increase uh, anomy and you decrease social capital. Um, Putnam has a new article demonstrating this as a very straight, fairly large linear effect. Diversity <coughs> makes people pull in, not trust each other, stay home and watch TV. They don't go out and associate as much when there's a diverse society. Uh, permissive parenting, reluctance uh, to punish, secularism, all of these things thin out the outer boundary, thin out the connections between people, greatly increase freedom and creativity. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, oh, this is terrible, we need to be conservative. I'm just saying there's a profile of costs and benefits to diversity and to liberalism. And we don't realize that. We think that we're on the side of right liberalism, freedom, uh, diversity, these are all good all the time. We're fundamentalists in a way about certain values. Um, and I think that we are sociologically speaking wrong and there are, it's easy to understand why we're wrong because we are all united by our moral vision and we have to hang together to fight them. So um, this is my conclusion. Uh, in my, in my last slide, that uh, if, we to do, uh, uh, if we're to do the Enlightenment right, we need to do morality right. And to do morality right, we need to understand the value of moral communal capital, and this is, I believe, why at least most Americans don't think that liberal is a good word. They think it's a bad word because it stands for the diminution of moral communal capital. 
Um, and uh, then lastly, if that's all true, we should be open, at least scientifically, to the possibility that religion is an adaptation for creating moral communal capital, uh, for creating a social hive. Religion is, I believe David got it right in his book Darwin's Cathedral, uh, that religion was crucial to the major transition that pulled, us, that pulled us up a level of organization. And if not for religion, it's possible that there would be no society, that we would still be very small bands of, of, of kin-based uh, you know, we'd be social, but we would not be ultra-social. So uh, that's my conclusion. I'll just put this last slide up. Uh, well, I guess we're not having a discussion now, but just to, you know, to re that's my suggestions for Enlightenment 2.0 are those three things. Thank you.